Purity culture is shaming. Your answer is no. And there will always be LGBT Christians. A million different voices, a million different opinions. Every day we're faced with a choice. What narrative will shape the way that we live? A world of confusion. Let's talk truth. Does the God of the Bible exist? Is it biblical to be pro-choice? Welcome to That's Debatable with me, Dr. Michael Brown. Hey everyone, welcome to That's Debatable with me, Dr. Michael Brown, where everything is debatable, but there's only one truth. On today's show, we're going to be debating an issue that impacts all of us in one way or another in today's culture. The question we're asking is, should Christians affirm transgender identities? Debating this topic with me today is Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr. Megan is the first openly transgender pastor ordained in the Lutheran Church and the current pastor of Grace Lutheran Church. Megan served for over a decade as the chaplain coordinator for the San Francisco Police Department, as well as a chaplain for the homeless and hungry in San Francisco. Megan was also featured on the Netflix show, Queer Eye. Well, thanks for coming on, Megan. It is great to have you here with us. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. So uh, how come you accepted our invitation to join me on the show? I, I truly believe that, that we, we can't be true Christians in fellowship unless we know each other. And perhaps knowing a, a faithful trans person is the first time for some folk, and it's worth it. Good. Well, look, we're not just talking about issues. We're talking about people. So that's why we're doing this together. We're going to pose the question, should Christians affirm transgender identity? So we're going to take a quick break. And after the break... Let's debate. Hey friends, let me encourage you to take 30 seconds and head over to my website, askdrbrown.org and sign up for our emails. I'll tell you more about my personal story from LSD to PhD. I'll tell you about the three R's of our ministry, revival in the church, moral and cultural revolution in society, redemption in Israel. And then every week we'll let you know about latest articles, latest videos, episodes of the debate show. So go to Ask Dr. Brown today and sign up for my weekly emails. I'll meet you there. Welcome back to That's Debatable with me, Dr. Brown. I'm joined by Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr. We're about to dive into a very controversial subject. Should Christians affirm transgender identities? We'll both have equal time to make our cases. We'll start with opening statements. So Megan, you'll be up first. You'll have three minutes on the clock. When three minutes is up, you will hear this delightful sound. All right, so your time starts now with your opening statement. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm Pastor Megan. I've been a pastor in the Lutheran Church since 2006 and doing chaplaincy with the homeless in San Francisco for about 19 years now. And I'm a parent of two beautiful children. I'm in a monogamous marriage. And I find that when people get to know people of faith, then they can let go of imagining worst case scenarios that they might imagine in people who are different than they are. Far too often, debates about trans identities has been based on the worst possible imagined trans person versus the best possible imagined non-trans person. That's not how Jesus lived his life. And my hope is that instead of arguing about what's politically correct, we can argue about what is biblically correct. Thankfully, we have a great roadmap left for us by Jesus. In fact, Jesus says that there's lots of different types of trans people, and those who are able to be trans for the sake of the kingdom of God should accept that. So what I will offer up today is what if we have limited our imagination to just assuming trans people are wrong, like we've done in each generation with different types of people, and what if God's imagination for a purpose in the world might be beyond what some people have imagined so far. Jesus, for example, when he decides which disciples to pick, goes along the shore of Galilee, picks the disciples who were male, who were sewing fishing nets. Sewing fishing nets was women's work. Why didn't he pick the other fisher people? We don't know, but we do know that Jesus transgressed some of those gender ideas about what was right and what was wrong. He got yelled at a lot because his disciples didn't wash their hands. They didn't follow the most strict rules. Jesus offered an alternative, an ethic of living in love. Like the ancient rabbis, I will argue that when trans people follow the same ethic, which is, does this calling from God bring you closer to God? 
then there is still boundaries. There are still limits. It's not the whole world falling apart just because we love trans people who are in our world. In fact, I think the gospel of Matthew calls us to be kind even to our enemies. It tells us we can tell people they're wrong three times. Then we have to let it go and eat with them like Jesus did with the tax collectors and sinners. And then immediately following, Jesus says we are to forgive 77 times. We are to be people whose kindness is not valued by how often we tell people they are wrong or that they are not called to something we are not called to, but we are to be valued by true kindness, which is loving folk where they are and celebrating them when they are faithful. I'm so glad that you're here with us because I want to put a face on the issue of transgender and say it's not just an issue, it's a person. It's a person like Megan. And that's, that's why I wanted to have this discussion with you. And by all means, we should be overflowing with the love of God and meet people exactly where they are. But Jesus' love is transformative. He meets us where we are and he brings us into God's best condition for us. The Bible is our roadmap. God created human beings, male and female. And that identity is always determined scripturally, biologically. There was no ambiguity about it. There was no question about it. Even when Jesus spoke about marriage, he spoke of the union of one man and one woman for life. When Paul would give guidelines for men and women and their distinctive giftings and callings, it was all based on biology. That was never questioned. There is no ambiguity whatsoever. In, in point of fact, uh, a massive study was made by the Weizmann Institute. They studied the human genes. It's, it's actually the molecular genetics department of the Weizmann Institute. And they found that over the 20,000 genes they studied, 6,500 of them present differently for male or female. In other words, someone can have sex change surgery. They can be on cross-sex hormones, but it doesn't change who they are. God made us male female, and Jesus heals us from the inside out. He, he, he made a human being, just think of this, forms them in the womb meticulously, carefully, male, female, makes their organs to, to produce a certain way and reproduce a certain way, makes everything to work a certain way. And, and then we come because of internal struggles, because of questions of identity and gender perception or, or gender dysphoria or, or however we want to describe it. And now we mar that beautiful creation. We take those things that God intended to be a certain thing. We, we have full mastectomies for 13-year-old girls that, that can't be right. There's an outspoken transgender critic of transgenderism right now in terms of sex chains, especially with children. Scott Nugent, who is female to male, points out that with what we do with, with hormones and with treatments and science, you end up with decreased life expectancy, increased risk of premature death from heart attacks, bone damage, possible liver damage, increased mental health complications, and on and on. I work with folks at the sexchangeregret.com website, and they're helping people who are still struggling. They're suicidal, depressed, other issues. I say the Jesus way is to meet someone where they are, to, to right where they are, to love them, to care for them as a fellow human being, and then to help them find wholeness from the inside out, rather than mutilating a healthy body, rather than putting them on hormones for the rest of their lives to be contrary to who they are. Wouldn't you agree with me that the Jesus way is to heal us from the inside out? All right, those are our opening statements. Now we'll each have two minutes for rebuttal. Megan, back over to you. I absolutely agree that Jesus heals us from the inside out, but I know that Jesus never once took a popularity vote to decide how to heal people or in which direction. So we know from ancient rabbis that there were six different types of, of sex and gender, and androgynous was a big part of that coming from the word androgynous. With over 149 references in the Mishnah and in the Talmud and 350 laws about how they can live their life from the second century to the 16th century. There was the tum-tum of which Abraham and Sarah were a part of the people who lived that way, the Ilamit and the Saris. So we know Adam who is made by God, Adam means mud. It was a person who was put to sleep by God, who then had their surgery 
And only after that surgery is there a definition of what is male and what is female. Later, Abraham is also called on to have his genitals modified through circumcision. And Paul has to do a lot of work in our New Testament to argue that you can still be Christian, even if your genitals are not modified. The best practices for trans health care say that people don't have any of those trans surgeries until after they're 18, until after they've had robust care. That is an invented idea of the worst possible scenario of what happened. This is a small number of people who are called by God to be trans. But when we are called by God, it would be helpful if rather than looking towards science to discern whether or not God loves us, we looked towards biblical role models who have been through the same thing. The entire book of Daniel is about a transgender individual. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, also transgender, they chose not to bow to the fiery furnace. There is no one God cannot use for God's purposes, including me. Megan, I don't doubt that God could use you in amazing and wonderful ways. I simply say there's a better way than what you've experienced so far. I'm a bit surprised about many of the biblical statements. It was common for fishermen to sew their nets. And, and when you're out, uh, out on a boat for days at a time, uh, it's you know, like, oh, let's get a woman to sew the net. No, men commonly sewed nets as fishermen. That's, that's not a mystery there. Uh, as, as for uh, Jesus speaking to a wide range of trans people, no, being someone that is a eunuch from birth means there is no sexual capacity and, and, and you cannot reproduce that is what a eunuch is. So some are made eunuchs. And by the way, it doesn't say that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were eunuchs. You read that into the text. It doesn't explicitly say that they were. But either way, that's not transgender. What the, if, if someone is a eunuch, they, the man is not trying to act as a woman. The man is not identifying as a woman. Jesus never speaks to that whatsoever because that was not an issue. Even later rabbinic tradition that, that you mentioned, and I'm quite familiar with these things, it is never a matter of a biological male Someone who is physically, biologically a male and can reproduce as a male, now identifying as a female. The vast majority of those who identify as transgender are biologically male or biologically female, not intersex. The vast majority of those that identify as trans, you'd know if you've done the science and done the research on it, they are people who could reproduce male, female. In fact, most of them wouldn't even identify as, as gay or lesbian. So it's a matter of feeling trapped in a wrong body. The biblical examples you give have nothing to do with that. Circumcision is not turning a man into a woman or a woman into a man. All of these things are relevant. It's trying to read something back into the Bible, which is why people reading scripture for centuries and centuries and centuries would never dream in a billion trillion years. I mean, no insult to you, but they would never ever dream of the interpretations you're putting on this or the idea that, that someone who is sexually incapacitated is somehow transgender. Not so. All right, we will now get into our rapid fire round. So that's one minute each, then 30 seconds each. We'll be right back after the short break. Hey friends, I hope you appreciate the work we're doing. We're willing to tackle the hot button questions and be the lightning rod and go places where very few are willing to go, but we do it with your help. I wanna invite you to partner with our ministry. Go to my website now, askdrbrown.org, click on donate, find out about becoming a monthly supporter. Every month we pour back into you with free resources, online classes you can take, all kinds of things to pour into you as you stand together with us. Friends, together we are making a difference. Welcome back to That's Debatable. I'm Dr. Brown, joined by Reverend Dr. Megan Rohr. We're debating if as Christians, we should affirm transgender identities. We've made our opening statements, rebuttals now, rapid fire. So we'll have a series of one minute exchanges and then 30 second exchanges, starting with you, Dr. Rohr, please. You put out there that no one could possibly imagine trans identities as I am imagining them. However, it was a big enough issue for the first 300 years of Christianity that was actually taken up as an issue by the Council of Nicaea. If you look at most major Christian art, you can find that angels are painted to be androgynous. As, they are, as I, I spoke to you about from those Hebrew words, you'll find faithful people who are messengers able to communicate from one group to another are often drawn to be exactly like people who transgress worlds. Because what is a better messenger 
uh, to explain things between men and women than someone who has had a toe dipped in both worlds. Augustine felt that way, right? Rebecca shepherded sheep and was doing things outside of the gender norm. And the most important story of all, Jesus said the Last Supper will take place where there is a man carrying water. Gender diversity was central to Jesus's story. Very common for women to shepherd sheep. We have examples of that, plenty of examples of that in the Bible itself. A man carrying water, please, that does not tell us that a man today should identify as a woman or vice versa. And the Council of Nicaea was not debating cross-dressing, transvestitism. It was not debating whether a man can live as a woman or have surgery to somehow modify. That was not a major Christian debate. Surely you know that, Megan. And, and look, bottom line, any of the examples you gave, even Adam does not mean mud. Adam comes from Adama, which is dirt, ground. But Adam itself means man, humanity, mankind. All right. The, the fact is God himself took this being and made this being male and out of him took female. It is not someone later on coming to Adam and saying, Adam, if you feel like you're really Eve, then let's give you further surgery. No, that's not the way it works. God wants you whole in the body he made for you, Megan. I just think it's pretty easy to point out that most of your, your information is resting on science and whether or not you think science and how medical practices are treating me is appropriate. But you haven't once yet contemplated that God is calling me to do a thing that is unique and something that God needs, someone whose gender is between worlds could possibly be a part of. I believe that Jesus's ethic of what is wrong is right is stemmed in Ezekiel 34. It's not concerned with sexuality. It's not concerned with gender. It's concerned with economic realities for individuals. When Jesus talks about sorting sheep from goats, no mention of the crazy wild Roman times that were happening in Jesus's day. And it's a far fetch if you want your viewers to believe that back in Roman days when Everything debaucherous was happening that there were zero trans people makes no sense. You know better. Yeah, actually, I'm primarily quoting scripture and looking to scripture and, and correcting misquotation of scripture. I've mentioned science just in passing a couple of times, but my, my issue is based on scripture. God made us male and female. Psalm 139 talks about how meticulously he forms us in the womb. He knew what he was doing. He didn't form you in the womb so that now you could take medical science to work against that. You could take medical science for hormones to stop you from being who God created you to be. Look, you may be one of the kindest people on the planet. You may be one of the most compassionate people on the planet. You may be a devoted parent. You care for the homeless. That's commendable. But you could do all that without being on hormones, without changing the body that God gave you. And in fact, you could give hope to people by saying right in this body where you don't feel at home, God can make you at home because he's the creator and he didn't make mistakes and he made male or female. Let's work with what he made and help people from the inside out. And that, that argument only works if you ignore Jeremiah where God says that sometimes the potter when working with clay remolds the clay into a new being and is able to show us a new way. I think there is a difficulty because some people lived through times when gender was explored and it was linked in the 70s to things like sex and drugs and rock and roll. But there's an even longer history of faithful people. There's at least 17 different saints in the prayer calendar who are saints because they were trans. People were believed to be faithful, to be spiritual messengers because they were trans, not in spite of it. There's lots of lovely people like Joan of Arc who have transgressed these boundaries for forever. Pretending it's like, you gross, something that's brand new is a made up thing that only happens because the printing press was invented in medieval times when people were afraid of plagues and afraid of their bodies. The history before that is much more open. You know, I, I stay with scripture. You quote Jeremiah 18, but completely out of context. It's about the potter. When God says he's going to bless a nation and the nation turns to sin, he'll turn the blessing into a judgment. When he says he's going to judge the nation and they repent, he'll turn it into a blessing. That's what he's talking about as the potter. Not telling a man, go on cross-sex hormones and, and then have your penis mutilated or changed in such a way that you are now going to, to appear female or, or function in a more female way. And he'll never be female, never be able to conceive or carry a child. No, that's, it's completely irrelevant. 
And, and, and it's for angels. Jesus said that, that we're not like the angels, that angels don't marry or have sex. So we're different than them. Human beings creating God's image made male, female. Throughout the Bible, biological sex is what distinguishes a man from a woman. Without exception, there's not one example in the scripture where biological sex is not the determinative mark as to whether this person is male or female. That's the way God set us up. That's the way he made us, right to our genes, thousands of them. Shout that out. And thankfully, because those rabbis had a more diverse understanding of sexuality and gender than you do, because they believe there were six different types, there's actually seven different sex change in the book of Genesis, just based on the misbegotten notion that if you were infertile, you weren't fully female. God can do what God wants wants to do. God's not limited by the fact that we only have a view of God's pinky toe and then make up what is possible for God based on that. God's way more powerful. Nowhere does the Bible say that if a woman can't have a child, she's not female. No, she's deprived of the joy of childhood. But look, you know people with body identity integrity disorder, and they're convinced that they shouldn't have a right leg or a left arm. Should they surgically have that arm or leg removed to give them mental peace? Is that part of God's amazing creativity to create someone with BIID? Surely you've studied this and, and know about it. And many say once they cut off the limb, they were happy and whole. No, God wants to help them from the inside out. Doesn't seem very much like Jesus to spend most of your time imagining worst case scenarios of other people. Imagining worst case scenarios of trans people when a small percentage of the population has the medical um, medical drive that you are even talking about doesn't make sense. We're talking about being kind to people who live with you when people make a different choice about whether to wear pants or a skirt. Gender identities are diverse and God calls you to love diverse people. I'm talking about best case scenarios, that God has a better way. Certainly, cross-sex hormones for life is not his best. Certainly, mutilating healthy parts of a body, having a 20-year-old girl have a full mastectomy simply because she identifies as a boy, that's not God's best. The best case scenario is for that human being to thrive in the body that God gave them. And for us as a community to say, we're here with you and your struggles, your ups and downs because we love you. And thankfully, on my entrance into church, no one checks my private parts. They're private. God knows them, but God loves me and believes that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, no matter how my body traverses through puberty, no matter what happens in my medical history, no matter whether or not I have cancer, no matter whether or not I make certain choices with my doctor or I don't. That's private, and God loves all of me, even my private parts. Actually, I wouldn't have known anything about you unless you were openly, loudly, proudly transgender. I would not have known any of that, nor would it have crossed my mind to inspect who you were. It's what you have chosen to put as part of your identity. And I'm saying God has a better way. You had to change the way he made you. I'm saying his best, his best is to help you from the inside out, find wholeness in the wonderful body that he gave you. That's his very best. All right, friends, we've gone back and forth, shared our views. And again, Megan, I am so glad you came on. It's so important that we don't just talk issues, but we talk people, people loved by God. So you get your last minute and then I go, go ahead. Thankfully, no other personality or type of identity has to be in a debate about their private parts, wondering, can God love you despite your private parts? That's not faithful. Jesus did not ask people to search people's private parts. Jesus asked people to love. And if you are called to love your enemy, then you are called to love trans people. If you are called to forgive 77 more times than you are called to point out that you think someone is wrong, then you are to love trans people. You get to be called by God in your unique way. Your family's body gets to be shaped by God in your unique way. And the good news is, no matter whether or not we agree at the end of this debate, God loves us all equally. 
My faith, the Lutheran faith, believes that we save time avoiding these debates, trusting that God loves us, trusting that God saved us, and we don't take the time to look at people's private parts. You know, of course, no one's talking about examining someone's private parts, but if someone who is visibly clearly a biological male walks into a church service wearing a dress and wants to use the ladies' bathroom, as just happened with one of my friends the other day, these raise real issues that we have to face. When your four-year-old says, Mommy, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a really a girl, why do they say I'm a boy? These are real issues that we have to face. And love tells us, help this one from the inside out. Jesus heals the brokenhearted. He touches us, makes us whole from the inside out. I don't look at this any differently than I look at someone with body identity integrity disorder. There's got to be a better way than amputating a limb. There's got to be a better way than a full mastectomy. There's got to be a better way than hormones for life. There's got to be a way to function and thrive in this body that God gave us. So, Megan, I'm with you. Love, 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 care, care, compassion, forgiveness, grace. But love also calls us to do the hard things. Love says there is a better way. Let's find it together. All right, Megan, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate you coming on and making yourself clear. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. And, and listen, we want you to think these issues through, to listen to what both of us had to say, to do your best to come to your own conclusions. And by all means, let's walk in love. Let's show the real compassion of Jesus. So I wanna encourage you to connect with me on Instagram. That's debatable. If there's a subject you'd like me to tackle, if you, you have a guest you'd like me to interact with, or you think you're qualified to come on and do a debate, post your comment there and let's connect it. That's debatable. I'm Dr. Brown, and I will see you next time. Over 35 years ago, as I was finishing up my PhD studies in Near Eastern languages and literatures, that my sister-in-law wrote to me with a series of questions. She was attending a faith-based Bible school, and it seemed that many of the things she was learning were, were contradicted by what was written in the Old Testament, and she couldn't sort it out. So I began to write a letter back to her, and that letter became a book, Compassionate Father or Consuming Fire. Now. More than 35 years later, we've put out a brand new updated edition of this book that answers the many questions that you've had about the God of the Old Testament. Is it true that there's a permissive tense in the Old Testament that God never smites anyone, but only permits it to be so? Is it true that Job opened the door to his own sufferings? How should we sort these things out? Friends, I think you'll really be helped by this brand new edition of the book, Compassionate Father, or consuming fire, engaging the God of the Old Testament.